Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Assembly Judiciary. We'd like to welcome, I see we have, I believe that's actually staff, but to welcome everyone here in Carson City, as well as anyone who may be joining us in Las Vegas, and of course, anyone watching us online through Nellis or uh, the legislature's YouTube channel. With that, Secretary, please take the roll. Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Cohen. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Gallant. Here. Assemblyman Gray. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Assemblywoman Newby. Assemblyman Orentlicker. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Miller. Here. And with that, please mark uh, members present when they arrive. Just a few quick reminders that please turn off any of your electrical items that will make noise in the middle of a hearing. We also will take public comment at the end. I know it's a, a, a huge adjustment, but we're asking people going forward not to include any kind of logos or graphics in any of your exhibits and just keep it to text and anything generated through your software for your charts and all of that kind of stuff. With that, today we have one presentation and one bill. We are going to take the agenda out of order, meaning that we will start with the bill presentation of Assembly Bill 68 first. Assembly Bill 68 revises provisions governing the assessment imposed on certain counties for the operation of a regional facility for the treatment and rehabilitation of children. <clears throat> With that, I will ask the presenters to approach the table. That will give you a moment to get settled. And when you are ready, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Patrick Cates. I'm the county manager for Douglas County. Uh, the bill before you today, AB 68, um, seeks to change uh, 62B of NRS, um, a section of the NRS that deals with uh, regional facilities for the treatment and rehabilitation of children. Um, this particular section of statute only applies to one camp in the state, and that is China Spring Youth Camp. Uh, China Spring Youth Camp is operated by Douglas County. It's under the supervision of the 9th Judicial District Court, Judge Young, and the um, employees at the camp are all Douglas County employees. Uh, Douglas County has been operating China Spring since the 1980s, and it serves all the counties in the state with the exception of Clark County. Uh, Clark County has uh, Spring Mountain Youth Camp, so they operate their own. And the state also has uh, three different facilities that are similar to China Spring. Um, China Spring Youth Camp um, serves up to 56 youths at a time, both male and female. And um, it is uh, routinely ranked one of the um, highest ranked facilities in the state um, in terms of their outcome. Um, so what we're trying to do here is pretty straightforward. Um, the current statute um, describes the funding formula for assessments for counties. So the camp's budget is funded primarily through assessments from the state, uh, you know, appropriations from the state, and assessments on the counties that it serves. Um, it also receives grants and stuff, but those are its two major um, portions of funding. Existing law for those county assessments is based on student population. Um, what we are seeking to do with this legislative change is to change that formula so that half of the assessment is based on student population and the other half is based on utilization of the camp. Um, and that would be determined by the two prior complete fiscal years in terms of bed days and utilization of the camp. And uh, the reason that we're uh, seeking to do this is uh, we've been working with the um, 16 counties that participate in the camp and, and going through a variety of issues to make sure that, that uh, the camp's meeting its mission and meeting their needs. And uh, one of the topics that came up was the fairness of that assessment. Uh, basing it on student population doesn't necessarily reflect how much the camp is being used by different counties. And so uh, a lot of counties liked having some of it be based on student population so that every county's paying something in all the time regardless of utilization. 
Um, but uh, the other half being, if we change that to be based on bed days, it's going to do some, it, it will not change the overall assessments to all counties, but it will shift the assessment between counties. So in the data set that we looked at that I, I believe you have the material for, um, that would, based on that data, there would be a slight decrease to Washoe County. Um, they are the largest utilizer of the camp, but in proportion to the student population, they don't send quite as many kids there as, as some of the other counties. Douglas County would see our assessment go up, um, as well as some other counties. Uh, it really, what it does in my mind is help the very small rural counties. Some of those counties may go a few years without sending a kid to camp, um, and it will, it will decrease that assessment on them. Uh, and again, uh, that's it in a nutshell. We're just trying to find a more equitable distribution among counties to fund this very important program. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. And members, do we have any questions? Will you recognize me, Madam Chair? Assemblyman Gray, do you have a question? I do, a quick one. Uh, will this uh, bill stabilize the operation? As you, as you know, I mean, I'm from Lyon County, Mr. Cates, and you know, we've uh, fought with funding issues over the past few years. Do you think we'll stabilize it a little bit more? And uh... Uh, For the record, Patrick Cates. Um, uh, so this bill um, doesn't change the overall funding for camp, uh, just makes it a little more equitable for the county. Um, you know, we did have some uh, funding challenges in the last biennium. Some of that was caused by COVID and, and some of the state budget cuts. Um, we've addressed all of those. The state's been really good about restoring funding. Um, so I think going forward, we're in a good position financially. This doesn't directly impact it, that. It's more equity among the counties that participate. Thank you, Assemblyman. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, and thank you for being here this morning. Um, I just had a, a question on the breakdown of what we're spending. I'm just curious for each child, is that how it's broken down by county? So you, is that something you can do? I just want to get that number on the record, if you know it. Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, I don't have a specific number per child. Um, this is more the aggregate budget of the camp. Uh, minus the state funding and the rest is county assessments. Um, I, I don't have a specific figure per child. I think the total funding of the camp, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, but it's about $5 million a year to fund the camp. Okay. Thank you. Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, just curious, are all the counties, when you've been talking to them, are they in agreement with this formula, or just what have their reactions been to the change? Uh, for the record, Patrick Cates, thank you for the question. Um, yes, we had robust discussion in the interim with participation on all 16 counties. We brought this language forward and talked it through and looked at different models, and all the counties were in agreement with this language. Thank you for that question, Assemblywoman. Not seeing any more questions, I will go ahead and open it up for testimony. So if there is anyone here in Carson City that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 68, remember we ask you to uh, Please begin with stating your name and spelling it so that we have it accurate for the record. And we ask that you keep your comments to two minutes. Again, another reminder that when we testify in support, that means we're testifying in support of its in the entirety of the bill. And I say that because sometimes people would, I support it, but, and kind of that's where it's like, so you don't fully support it. So the same with opposition, and then of course there's neutral. Of course, anyone, if there is anyone in Las Vegas, you can prepare to um, approach as well. But we'll start here in Carson City. Thank you, Chair Miller, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Berthium. That's J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-B-E-R-T-H. 
I-A-U-M-E. I serve as the Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 68 on behalf of NACO. AB 68 represents a collaborative agreement on the methodology to provide funding for the Regional Treatment and Rehabilitation Facility utilized by 16 of Nevada's 17 counties. This equitable assessment to counties reflects usage of this facility and as such, NACO is in support of AB 68. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Mary Walker representing Douglas County, Lyon County, and Story County. We rise in support of AB 68 without reservation. <laughs> uh, a couple of things. First off, um, this uh, formula hasn't been changed in a couple of decades. Uh, and secondly, for many rural counties, this, is, uh, this China Springs is the only juvenile services they have in their entire county. So it's really important to us and uh, we appreciate your consideration of this bill. Good morning, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Cadence Matijevic, C-A-D-E-N-C-E-M-A-T-I-J-E-V-I-C-H, and I have the pleasure of representing Washoe County as their government affairs liaison. Uh, as you heard earlier, Washoe County was an active participant in the working group during the interim, uh, and we are in support of this bill. We appreciate the equity that it brings uh, to the formula for the funding of the China Springs Center uh, and would uh, ask for your supports as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone in Las Vegas that would like to testify in support of Assembly Bill 68? Not seeing anyone in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, please open the line. For anyone that would like to call in and testify in support, the phone number is 1-669-900-6833. And the meeting ID number is 865-784-47953. If you would like to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 68, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open and working. However, none of the callers wish to participate at this time. Thank you. I will go ahead and open it up for testimony for anyone in opposition of Assembly Bill 68. If there's anyone here in Carson City, please approach. Anyone in Las Vegas, please approach. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line to testify in opposition for Assembly Bill 68? Testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 68, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers at this time. Thank you. I will now open it up for anyone testifying in neutral of Assembly Bill 68. If there's anyone here in Carson City? Not seeing anyone. Is there anyone in Las Vegas? No one in Las Vegas is approaching broadcasting. Is there anyone on the line that would like to testify in neutral? If you would like to testify in neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers. Okay, thank you for that. With that, would you like to make any final statement? Okay, thank you. I, I would just like to say I do appreciate it when all the different municipalities and groups are working together and, and come together for, with a solution and support one another. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and close the hearing on Assembly Bill 68. Thank you. I will open it up for our next agenda item, which is a presentation on juvenile justice. We have the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Cindy Pitlock, Administrator for Juvenile Services, Division of Child and Family Services, the Deputy Administrator for Juvenile Services, also from the Division of Child and Family Services, Sharon Anderson. From Washoe County Office of the District Attorney, we have the Chief Deputy District Attorney of the Juvenile Division, Shelley Scott, and from the Clark County Office, we have the Assistant District Attorney of the Juvenile Division, Bridget Duffy. 
with that, it, let me just ask, Ms. Duffy, are you presenting or you're after? It is completely up to you all. I just don't want to forget to, okay, thank you. All right, and give you a few moments to get settled and whenever you're ready, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Dr. Cindy Pitlock and I serve as the administrator of the Division of Child and Family Services. With me today is Sharon Anderson, Deputy Administrator over our Juvenile Justice Services. We'd like to work through a fairly high level PowerPoint with you this morning to tell you who we are, what we do, who we serve, and some of our high level successes and challenges and then we would love to open it up for any questions that you may have. Uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, may we continue? Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sharon Anderson, and I serve as the Deputy Administrator of the Division of Child and Family Services, Juvenile Justice Services, um, and it's my pleasure to share our programs with you today. So this slide shows our mission and vision. Next slide, please. Nevada has always believed that youth and adults should be treated differently and in different systems, which is why the juvenile justice system is kept in the Division of Child and Family Services. So I would like to share with you some key differences between the adult justice system and the juvenile justice system. In the adult system, the person is referred to as the defendant the defendant is found guilty or convicted by a judge or a jury, and then they are sentenced. The judge determines what that sentence is based on minimum and maximum terms as prescribed by the applicable Nevada revised statutes. In the juvenile system, the person is referred to as the youth or child interchangeably, and rather than a conviction, there is an adjudication. Judges adjudicate the youth as delinquent, and the judge can choose to keep the youth in their county under their local county probation department supervision or commit them to the Division of Child and Family Services. There is no determinate sentencing for juveniles in the state of Nevada. The length of stay in a facility is determined by the youth's progress within the program. And the average length of stay in our state juvenile justice facilities is um, about six to nine months. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide outlines county versus state roles the counties are usually the youth's first um, contact with the juvenile justice system. They, um, they try to intervene at the lowest level possible. Now for the typical teenager, if they get involved um, with any part of the front end interventions, this would deter them from getting into more trouble and going through the process again. Others may continue to engage in delinquent behavior and face more county level interventions. But at a certain point, judges will make the decision to commit a youth to the state. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the juvenile justice funnel. Our counties, again, they do a really great job at diverting and keeping youth in their communities with their prevention services, which can be seen by the narrowing of the, of the funnel. And their work keeps many youth out of state custody. So before I get into what our division does, once a youth is committed to us, I wanna point out that our work in juvenile justice is guided by federal standards of care outlined by the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. The act is based on a broad notion that children, youth, and families involved with both the juvenile and adult criminal justice system should be guarded by federal standards for care and custody while also upholding the interests of safety and the prevention of victimization. The law also promotes the use of alternatives to incarceration when possible, aiming to lean in on community supports and services, including mental health services. So we recognize the impact of exposure to violence and trauma on behavior and development, and all of our staff are trained in trauma-informed care. We have implemented um, an evidence-based assessment that helps us match evidence-based practices to our youth based on their needs. Um, we are also working to address racial and ethnic disparities throughout the juvenile justice system through our work with the Juvenile Justice Oversight Commission. And we also engage, um, focus on family engagement, which I will talk about later in this presentation. 
So when a youth is committed to DCFS, we take into consideration the majority of them experience some type of trauma in their lives, whether it's physical, emotional, or sexual abuse. They are coming from tough situations and many of them were not set up for success. With this in mind, our admissions team reviews the documentation for each newly committed youth and makes a placement determination based on each youth's history and needs. Some youth are appropriate for placement in one of our state facilities. They are the youth who have not been successful with county level interventions. Their delinquent behavior has escalated or the nature of their crime causes the judge to bypass county interventions altogether. However, some youth are committed to our care who are not appropriate for a juvenile justice facility. These are youth who are in need of significant mental health services. This is a youth who has been actively suicidal within the last month or so, has multiple co-occurring co diagnoses, or has a profound intellectual or developmental disability. These youth are typically diverted to a mental health facility in our state or to specialized treatment in other states. If a mental health placement is not available, these youth end up spending ex extended times in detention centers while appropriate placement is being sought. In these scenarios, we have actually seen um, courts rescind commitment orders and place youth back on probation. Our admissions team has also diverted some of these cases and placed these youth back at home and wrap them in services offered by our sister agency, Wraparound in Nevada. Um, we have also connected them to outpatient mental health services, as well as placed them on a global positioning system device or GPS for public safety. Um, we also have unique challenges with youth who are in the child welfare system and in the custody of a child welfare agency who are also committed to um, the custody of DCFS. Finding an appropriate placement upon their release can be a challenge. These youth do not have a family home to return to and foster care placements are scarce. Unfortunately, through no fault of their own, some remain in our facilities longer than necessary while a placement is being sought. There is um, a need for more community-based service um, options for these youth and our team really struggles with how to support these youth. Back to the youth who are appropriate for one of our state facilities. So these youth are admitted to either the Caliente Youth Center um, or, or the Nevada Youth Training Center, which are both staff secure facilities, or they're admitted to the Summit View Youth Center, which is a higher level security facility. Once they arrive at the facility, it is not our job to punish them. Their commitment and time spent away from their families is a significant consequence for their actions. Remember, we do not have determinate sentencing. We have programming that lasts between six to nine months. We don't want youth in our facilities longer because we know that research that says that keeping them longer is not helpful to them. In fact, it impacts their mental health and it does not reduce delinquent behavior. When they are committed to us, we are here to help them. We provide a comprehensive array of services to address the needs identified and each youth has a program that is de developed specific to their individualized needs. So each facility has an on-site school that allows youth to earn credits towards their high school diploma, or they can earn a high school equivalent certificate. We have limited career and technical education opportunities as we have struggled with obtaining and maintaining the teachers to teach these classes. And each facility offers mental health services. So this slide shows the variety of mental health and substance use services at each of the three facilities. Again, we are he here to help these youth. Our mental health teams and our facilities work hard to address the mental health needs of the youth in their care. We are seeing an increasing need for a wide range of mental health services for youth in our care, including youth with self-harm thoughts and actions. These are the youth who have experienced a history of trauma. Um, we serve pregnant youth through their um, second trimester. These youth receive prenatal care and are paroled and returned to their community prior to their third trimester due to the prenatal care needs being more extensive. So <clears throat> I do wanna take a moment to share something about our facility staff. Our staff have a heart for these youth and are committed to helping them succeed. We have had youth become suicidal and even make serious attempts on their lives. And due to the diligence of our staff, these youth's lives were saved and these youth were subsequently transitioned into a psychiatric hospital um, care, right? 
So we know that youth do better in the juvenile justice system when they maintain a strong relationship with their family and when their family can be involved in their treatment planning process. DCFS has a statewide plan outlining the responsibility of facilities and the Youth Parole Bureau to engage families in their child's treatment throughout their commitment um, to DCFS. The state's family engagement plan is designed to increase the youth's family's contact with their youth while they are placed at one of our facilities. This includes engaging them in the development of their child's case plan and inviting them to monthly child and family team meetings where the family is able to actively participate and provide feedback on the plan and make suggestions to improve the plan. Since COVID, we have actually had more family engagement with the youth in our care, as this is when we began using video conferencing for visits and for meetings. We also have a family travel plan um, program that financially assists families if that is a barrier to them visiting their child while residing in one of our facilities. Okay, so when a youth completes their programming at our facility, um, they achieve parole status and are returned to their communities and placed back with their families. Depending on their individualized needs and their aftercare plan, youth can be placed on a GPS device. If they have significant substance use issues and are assessed as needing more intensive substance use treatment, these youth are entered into the parole drug court, court program. Many of the youth are assigned a psychosocial rehabilitation and basic skills training community partner to help them successfully transition back into their home and community. These youth are also initially placed on intensive supervision, which includes 45 days of house arrest, um, where they are seen weekly by their youth parole counselor. The youth parole counselor also meets with the family and monitors the youth's school attendance. And our youth parole counselors, they also really care about these youth that are under their supervision. And they often serve as advocates, as coaches, as support figures to the youth that they supervise. And the goal of parole is to supervise these youth, transition back into the community, and assist them with the goals related to their independence and to reduce their risk to reoffend. <clears throat> so the next two slides highlight our programs office, which is a small office of state I'm sorry, six state employees who are responsible for policies, planning, and quality assurance of the system and management of federal grants. They also gather and evaluate data for us to make more informed, uh, for us to make informed decisions and to fulfill various reporting requirements and to monitor performance-based standards. You may have heard the term PREA when talking about services and staffing. This is the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which is a federal act supporting the prevention, detection, and response to sexual abuse and sexual harassment within facilities. Minimum staffing ratios must include an appropriate number of staff to keep both of our, our youth and the staff safe. So this slide um, shows some of our successes and our challenges. I'll first discuss some of our successes. So DCFS was the subject of an investigation by the Department of Justice regarding the use of OC spray in our facilities. This investigation was closed satisfactorily. In fact, the use of OC spray has decreased significantly with only two incidents last year in 2020 compared to 33 incidents in 2019. OC spray is only used as the last resort, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to restore safety and security to a facility. See, just last week, <clears throat> Summit View Youth Center was recognized by the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports Program, also known as PBIS, as a platinum level implementation site and received the platinum level award for their work with the PBIS program. This team also presented their work at the PBIS National um, Conference this past October in Chicago, Illinois, as well as last week at the conference that they held in Las Vegas, Nevada. The Summit View Youth Center is identified by the National PBIS Organization as a model correctional program that implements PBIS to fidelity. Um, another success is that due to the number of female youth committed to DCFS and the challenges with admitting them into the Caliente Youth Center in a timely manner, we have expanded our services by opening a female dorm at the Nevada Youth Training Center in Elko, Nevada. 
These beds are prioritized for female youth who are from our northern counties to keep them closer to their families. Opening up the Nevada Youth Training Center for females has helped to decrease the wait times for female admissions. Um, but note that we do still continue to serve female youth at the Caliente Youth Center. That hasn't changed. Now for our challenges. So like other state agencies, staffing is a huge challenge. It creates safety issues for both youth and staff in our facilities and results in youth waiting in detention for placement into our facilities. We are having staffing and retention challenges in our Youth Parole Bureau, which has resulted in significant increased caseloads for our youth parole counselors. Um, the United States Department of Justice released a final report titled Investigation of Nevada's Youth of Institutions to Serve Youth with Behavioral Disabilities. The report highlighted that Nevada does not provide adequate services in the least restrictive setting to youth with behavioral disabilities. There is not adequate access to community-based services and Nevada over relies on institutional settings. As previously mentioned, there is an increase in mental health needs of youth committed to DCFS and a lack of mental health placements and community-based services. Um, some, character, it, some characteristics of youth um, make it difficult to mix with other populations. For example, youth with severe mental health needs or profound disabilities and juvenile sex offenders may be better supported in smaller groups, more focused on their needs. And this poses a challenge in terms of physical space and um, staffing and can result in sending these youth out of state to get their needs met. Um, discharge planning is so important because we don't want to see these youth coming back to us, right? Finding the needed supports in the community and connecting the youth with those supports is a constant struggle. Discharge planning, primarily for youth who are also a part of our child welfare system, you know, they don't have a family home to return to. We have youth who spend months in our care after they have achieved parole status, they've completed their program, they've graduated high school or earned their high school equivalency, um, they receive a parole date and there's nowhere for them to go. This has a ripple effect on our system as this often delays the admission of another youth who has been in, det in detention waiting to be transported to their respective facility. Over the past years, um, Nevada has seen a reduction in vocational programs offered to youth in our juvenile justice facilities. Trade programs including hospitality, food services, welding, auto mechanics, textiles, graphic arts, and computer technology can provide youth with skills that lead them to jobs with sustainable wages to support themselves. And we are working to build up that program in all of our facilities, but this continues to be a challenge. Again, our goal is to support the youth um, committed to our care and to reduce their risk to reoffend. That concludes our presentation, and we are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'm just wondering, Ms. Duffy, if you want to proceed or would you like us to eat to ask questions separately? Uh, Bridget Duffy, for the record, uh, Madam Chair, it's it's really up to you. I have a very short presentation that really just focuses on what the Clark County District Attorney's Office has been doing. So they might want to ask questions. Okay, back to their facilities. Certainly, and I I think members right now, I'm sure there's questions that are coming up, and so we'll go ahead and we'll proceed with questions. So members, if you have any questions right now for uh, the Department of Health and S Human Services or for Washoe County. And then we'll go ahead and, and focus on our questions for Clark. So we actually do have a question uh, beginning with Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. I, I think it goes without saying, I think we all appreciate the incredible job that you have and, and uh, appreciate your successes and certainly understand the challenges that you face. Um, I'm gonna kind of piggyback a question. So if chair will allow, <laughs> I just need a Proceed. definition. Um, if you could address why in juvenile services we address um, issues with the youth as 20, we go to 20 versus not using that, the standard for a minor being under 18. 
if, if you could do that. I mean, sometimes we see, and for those who are new, that when we're dealing with a, a juvenile offenders, we go to the age of 20, they're treated a certain way versus some things we, we see that minors can do, uh, but we consider 18. Is that doable? <laughs> I'm going to field this one. Assemblywoman Hanson, Bridget Duffy, for the record. Uh, it's a jurisdictional issue in statute. So we can only charge um, children under the age of 18 as juveniles for a delinquent act. However, they can stay on parole or probation up to age 21. So if they were to commit a, an offense in the community at age 19, that's a criminal offense but they could still be on juvenile parole or probation so that we can still infuse services into the family until they're 21. And thank you. That, that's what I was hoping we could address uh, so that we uh, have that understanding as part of the Judiciary Committee. Um, and then as far as when you talked about discharging and we talk about in family engagement, I know how important it is to connect back with the family, but do we also assess that sometimes family could be part of the major problem for this youth and and how, who makes that assessment that perhaps the child being connected to the family um, is the toxic factor uh, um, some of the time and so how does that assessment happen Sharon Anderson for the record to you chair through you to the committee member thank you for that question our team immediately once we receive the case reach out and connect with the families and um, you know there are times when you are able to see that there are some issues in the family that may contribute to kind of the situation that the youth is in um, we really do try to focus on strengths of the family and build on that and um, if we see a need for some additional support in that family to help strengthen um, the the family to be able to better care for that youth when they return we offer that we also um, do um, offer family counseling um, and we have community partners that we work with that also do work in in the homes to really even help train some of the family members to be stronger supports of our youth that, um, that when, once they return home so thank you and with that I also wanted to mention that you can go directly to the members when responding. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I agree with my colleague. Thank you for the work that you do. I'm sure it's, it's very tough and difficult to see such young people go through challenging times and be in, in situations when they're in the justice system. So my question um, is about the mental health services that you mentioned and the, the lack thereof. Um, could you just discuss that a little bit? What are some of the barriers to having more mental health providers? Um, do you have, are they in-house in these facilities? Is online services available? You know, have we made any progress um, attracting mental health providers um, into these facilities and to help these youth? So if you could just expand on that topic a little bit, thank you. For the record, Cindy Pitlock, thank you, Assemblywoman Hansen. So with successes and challenges uh, come solutions, and I can say that we have made a little bit of progress in that area through COVID because it really did help us focus on more of a telehealth model. I think in general, I would say that staffing challenges, provider access challenges continue to be a problem. Uh, the increased acuity levels of our youth and our services has been notable. So meaning that we have youth that really have intensive mental health needs. And so one thing that we really would love to see is being able to strengthen our mental health programming, not only in our facilities, but also to have those access points for those youth that really don't need to be in one of our JJ facilities, but really need mental health services. So it's like, which one is driving which, right? Is it the mental health issues that are driving the behavior? 
um, if we go upstream and, and really intensively wrap around mental health services, can we prevent placement into a facility or for ha perhaps shorten that length of time in the facility? Absolutely, that would be our goal. Staffing challenges, huge, huge for us, really. Uh, some of our youth in our facilities even need one-to-one -one supervision because of their mental health needs or their desire for self-harm. And when you have a facility that is short-staffed as it is to, to literally take staff and assign them one-to-one -one creates risk for other youth and other staff members. So quite a little package rolled into that concept. Yeah, thank you for that question and that recognition. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I'm looking at the slide, uh, slide eight, and seeing under capacity for each of these centers, youth centers, that the overall capacity number is much higher than the budgeted amount. So I'm curious, wondering what that means. Is that means that there's empty beds? Is that a staffing issue? What, if you can explain that, thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Cindy Pitlock, for the record, directly to you, to the Assemblywoman. So what we really tried to show with slide eight, uh, if you don't mind, I'll get back to it, um, was the, the difference between capacity and what are staffed beds. So when we prepare our budgets, we don't necessarily budget to full capacity if we can't staff those beds. Thank you. So then, just to, I, because I know there are folks, uh, you, youth waiting in facil other facilities to come to this area. So this is a staffing issue, or is this always budgeted? And then if you um, are able to get closer to capacity as opposed to budget, as far as beds concerned, do you have to make up that funding somewhere? For the record, Dr. Pitlock, directly to you, at permission of the chair, it's a staffing issue. Uh, bottom line, if we had appropriate and safe staffing, we could accommodate more youth into the program. You. You're welcome. So I, I would like to follow up on my colleague's question. So are we saying, are there opportunities where youth are denied service because of capacity issues? Sharon Anderson, for the record, to you, Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, youth are not denied um, placement when they are appropriate for a facility. They just may um, remain in detention longer until the bed is available, right? Because we need the, the staffing to be able to safely um, supervise those youth and provide them with the programming that we have. So it really just causes a delay with them entering into the program more than anything. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Gallant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, back in long time ago in Atlanta, I worked in a facility much like you guys are talking about providing mental health services. So I'm very aware, and I apologize. It's brought up a lot of memories that I've tried to like some horrible stories. Um, and so my question here is, most of these kids come from pretty traumatic and violent um, homes. And a lot of times it's not the biological parent, but is somebody else living in the home. Um, and the families really need to have family counseling in order for them to succeed. And what we found was very few of those families um, participated. So I'm curious if you guys are keeping stats on how many families are participating so that we have a benchmark to see how we improve and, and meet certain goals um, and then be able to also measure what's working and what incentives are working and also the success rate from that as well. For the rector, Dr. Pitlock, directly to you, uh, Assemblywoman. So very great question. Um, I would, uh, and thank you for the work that you've done in this area in the past, it's, it's very emotionally charged and I'm sure has brought up some memories for you. I would say that uh, discharge planning begins for youth and families, even hopefully prior to admission. 
but at least upon admission uh, to wrap the family in the services that we need. Um, I don't know that we have specific stats on family participation. I think that would be illuminating for us to help us really determine uh, better uh, foci of, of services. And I'm going to ask my data analytics people if that's something that we can track. Thank you for the question. Our next question is from Assemblywoman Mosca. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for all that you do for our youth. We really <clears throat> appreciate it. I just had a question regarding the discharge planning. Are you able to work with the school districts or the placement in education? And if not, what barriers exist for that? Sharon Anderson, for the record, thank you for the question, um, Chair. Remember, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so we do work with the local um, school districts who then we also have a liaison who helps the youth get connected with their local, their own um, local school districts. And we make sure all the documentation is able to follow them so that they can enroll in school. And our youth parole counselors are also a resource for the youth to actually get them to school and help them um, get enrolled. And so we actually do have a good working relationships with our, um, with our school uh, stakeholders also. So mm -hmm. thank you for the question. Thank you. Not seeing any additional member questions, I would like to invite Dr. Pitlock, if you would like to leave, you are more than welcome to. And then I will, we will stay with our district attorney's offices because again, I feel like after Deputy DA Duffy presents, there'll be again some uh, similar questions for juvenile justice, but thank you so much. Oh no, ma'am, I would like you to stay. Yes, <laughs> we're, 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 we're keeping our, our DAs up here, <laughs> okay? We're just gonna give HHS a break right now and then uh, the ability to invite more. So sh we have three chairs, we're just gonna shuffle around, okay? Yes, because I, I believe some of the questions will be similar again. So when you're ready, Deputy D DA. Yes, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the committee. I am Bridget Duffy. I am now newly titled the Assistant District Attorney in Clark County over the Juvenile Division. So um, for those of you, I see a lot of new faces, so like a quick two-sentence introduction of, of who I am. I am on my 23rd year of my legal career in Clark County um, handling juvenile issues. I started out handling um, abuse and neglect for children in the foster care system. Um, and then starting in 2012 with appointment by DA Wolfson into my current position, I now handle the abuse neglect cases in foster care as well as the juvenile delinquency stuff. So 23 years, I'm gonna put you down. I'm only really gonna discuss the juvenile delinquency stuff. I think the child welfare stuff is more of an HHS issue for you all. Um, so my first slide kind of just give you an entryway of how cases get to me in the juvenile justice system. So kids come in by two ways, um, arrest or citation. So a ticket, um, misdemeanors. Um, in Clark County, there are many opportunities to divert misdemeanors before my office even sees them or the court even sees them. So if you look down the one um, level of the slide, a misdemeanor will potentially go to juvenile probation first and a probation officer will meet with the child. We also have our diversionary programs through the harbor. So every misdemeanor in Clark County where a child is not actively on probation goes directly to our juvenile assessment center called the harbor um, before it even sees a probation officer. Probation officers can do informal supervision without the case even going to the court. And then if all that fails, it finally comes to me. So all of those levels of first time misdemeanors and then ultimately, ooh, you don't wanna do that one? It doesn't have my notes on it. Yeah. You can do that one too, right? 
So if all else fails, then it comes to me. And then on the other side, you have gross misdemeanors and felonies. Um, by statute, those need to be screened by the district attorney's office first to determine whether or not we want to file. So if we want to file, then we file. If not, we can send them back to the probation department to handle informally. Uh, if we determine to file, then, um, then we end up in the juvenile justice court system. So my juvenile division has 56 uh, employees. 29 of them are deputy district attorneys. Uh, nine of those DDAs are in the, my delinquency team. The rest of them, the 20 of them, are in my child dependency teams. I have one victim advocate for all of these cases that you will see we have, an investigator and some process servers. Um, knowing um, my appearance in front of this committee many, many years, um, I know that stats are very important, so I do my best to bring you what I believe you are uh, interested in. Um, I will say that the uh, juvenile division of the DA's office does not have its own case management system, so I rely on others to obtain stats. Um, I was going to drop off 2017, maybe next session I will, but I kept it there. I think it's great to see the progression of where we've come. Um, I've been, as I said, I've been in this job uh, running the juvenile division since 2012. So in 2017, you can see we had uh, 5,700 referrals and filed 4644. In 2022, you see we have almost the same amount of petitions. We have 5,800, and we filed 2748. That's a significant decrease in filings, and that's because we have, over the past several years, really built up our diversionary programs for juveniles in Clark County. So we're only filing about half, we being the District Attorney's Juvenile Division, are only filing half of what we see. But what you will see in that 2022 um, stat is 246 petitions to certify children to the adult system. Uh, we, of those 246, certified only 64. The year before, in 2021, we had 159 petitions to certify and certified only 48. I'm probably going to get questions about the why, so I'll try to uh, answer some of those now. Um, in 2022, I'm going to talk about AB 230 in a little bit, but in, in we had the passage of AB 230, so that took out a chunk of children that were directly filed to the adult system that we now filed certifications for. That's a, that um, is about 44 additional certification petitions. Um, we've also had a, a lot of gun charges in this last year, a lot of gun charges. And one thing that the certification process does for the juvenile system, and it mandates an evaluation, like a risk evaluation for the community, and so that we can then make a better determination on behalf of community safety if this child could be treated in the juvenile system versus treated in the adult system because we don't get that, that type of evaluation without that certification motion. Just to kind of say why we may have that increase. I'm gonna skip this one because it's really right here. Both 2021 and 2022 are top 10 charges. Um, violation of probation, um, that's gonna get me, most of those violation of probations that you see come with a substantive offense. So it's not just a, they didn't check in with a probation officer or they failed a, a year analysis. These are, they're on probation and they commit a substantive offense. So that's, that's why it comes as one of our top charges. The other issue uh, goes to Assemblywoman Hansen's question, which is when family is the issue, I don't wanna call them a problem, we'll call them an issue, <laughs> um, something that needs to be addressed. So one thing that we struggle with in the juvenile division is when we have 13, 14 year olds on juvenile probation and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And then holding that 13 and 14 year old accountable for that is a difficult thing because getting to counseling, especially if you're talking about a teenage boy, because I, I have a 15 year old that I have to hold accountable every day just to do the minimal things at home, right? So. You, if you're going to expect that your 13, 14, 15 year old is going to hold themselves accountable to get to counseling, that's, that's an issue. And that's really more of a family issue. So these violations of probation, at least in Clark County, our probation department has put in a really rigorous um, 
level of oversight before a probation officer can, can request a violation of probation. It has to go all the way up the chain of command because they do not want these just minor infractions ending up bringing back a kid into court. So most of these are issues that we have within the family, not, not helping the kid get through those terms or um, they're committing additional offenses. Then you see our next level, and as I said, these firearms offenses, um, they are uh, really increasing when our, top, our next top two offenses are robberies and minor in possession of a firearm. That's, those are pretty significant things in our community. Battery constituting domestic violence has been an ongoing issue and has increased since our pandemic a year. Um, and a lot of those, the families themselves want court interventions to address their issues. I'll talk a little bit about some diversion services we're trying to get in place there to stop bringing kids into court on these types of issues. Battery constituting domestic violence is mostly a child on a parent. We do have um, several, cat, several um, interpersonal, like boyfriend, girlfriend, serious cases too. Um, and then you'll see uh, batteries themselves. Those are misdemeanors, but we have robbery with use of deadly weapons, robberies. In 2021, our sex assault numbers were really high coming out of our 2020 pandemic years. They were 196 in 2021 for filed charge. Um, so just in reference, I can show you they, they've decreased a little bit in 2022. That's the only reason I put that on there for you. So our diversionary services, um, very proud of them. We have the Harbor Program, our Juvenile Assessment Center that this um, body has been very supportive of, came into play in 2016. Um, with regard to questions around our engagement with schools in Clark County, our Clark County School District is a great partner with us. Um, we have developed the school justice partnerships and what we have determined to be focus acts. One thing um, we know uh, as experts in our field is that a kid that is educated and in school is less likely um, to be doing better than victimizing our community. So trying to really reduce, reduce those exclusionary practices that schools have um, that are mostly affecting our minority population. Um, that is coming up and butting heads against some, some issues with some school violence that is going on that needs to be addressed. And I, I guarantee you those things that need to be addressed are being addressed outside of schools. Um, we have our restorative justice program that I'm working with the Attorney General's office on. Uh, that is also being run through the harbor. That um, is a restorative, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a practice where the person who is harmed by the delinquent act or crime meets with a trained mediator, facilitator, with the person who actually committed the offense or is the person who did the harm, and they come together and they, they, they have an opportunity to talk about how it impacted them so that the person who committed the act can hear that, and they together can come up with a resolution of how, this, how they should be held accountable um, for, for what happened. It's, it's an old practice. It's, it's very fascinating if you have not researched it. Um, those people that we can, we can get to participate because it's voluntary are satisfied with it, but it is very hard to, to, to get victims to want to be there and understand that process. We don't have a really good PR around it, so, but we do have, um, we have had some success with it. Uh, dual status youth, you heard Deputy Administrator Anderson talk about the difficulty we have with children who are foster care, who are entering into the juvenile justice system. Um, they absolutely stay longer in our system. They stay longer in our facilities. Uh, they have worse outcomes because they don't have supportive people in the community to care for them when they come out. Uh, Clark County is working with the Robert F. Kennedy Foundation out of Washington, D.C. We are piloting a program that should be in effect this spring um, to do early interventions on kids uh, that are in both status so that we can try to prevent them from going to uh, Deputy Administrator Anderson's facilities because if I'm talking about front end, I'm talking about Clark County, I'm talking about kid, trying to get into kids before they end up in any of our correctional care. So those are the, um, those are the areas that we are, are working on. Um, the impact of AB 230, which was Assemblyman Miller's, he was on judiciary last year, this was his bill. Um, it has been in place for 16 months. There were 44 children, so uh, for those of you who weren't here last session, um, 
prior to this bill, children who were 16 and 17 who committed a, I'm just gonna call it a crime, just to be simple, to committed a crime in our community with a, with a gun, and they had already had a felony in the juvenile justice system. So they already had a felony on their record, and they committed a, a crime with a firearm in our community at the age of 16 or 17. They bypassed juvenile justice altogether and went to the adult system. So that's, that's the way the law worked before. Now, after AB 230, those children who commit crimes with guns at age 16 or 17 stay in the juvenile justice system and my office must file to put them into the criminal system. So when we testified about this bill, um, and I was in support of it at, at, the, time of the, at the time of the bill, um, in 2019 and 2020, we had a total of 21 kids that had been impacted by the fact that they went directly to the criminal system because of prior felony record. In, because of our firearms crimes have increased, and you can see doubled uh, plus, in uh, the 16 months, 44 kids now pre-AB 230 would have gone criminal, but they stayed in juvenile. We filed certification petitions on all 44 of them. We certified only 14 of the 44. So 30 of those children had an opportunity to stay in the juvenile justice system in a juvenile placement, not in the criminal system. Unfortunately, of those 44, uh, of those 30 that stayed, 18 of them reoffended within this, and it's only been 16 months. Um, so they were either uh, after finishing their services or um, while still on uh, parole or probation. So we still have some work to do, and, I, and I'm going to talk about it when I talk about moving forward, but and really how we get there and impact, impact kids from, com uh, from preventing them from recidivating. So what we still have left in our juvenile system that goes directly to the adult system are our direct files, or what some people might call auto certification. So we have um, murder and attempt murder for children who are age 16 or 17 who commit murder or attempt murder. They go directly to um, the adult system. Um, I think most people um, would recognize a case out of Clark County with a student, with a teacher in the classroom um, where he uh, tried to kill her five times and sexually assaulted her. He was age 16 or 17 and he went directly to the adult system. I, I never saw his case um, at all. So he is one of our uh, 2021, I believe, cases. Oh no, he was 2022. So you can see we've had a reduction and that's, that's something I'm, I'm really happy about because that's uh, less children committing murder or attempt murder, but in 2022 we had eight. So moving forward, if you were to ask me what I really wanted, because I know you all want to ask me what I really want and what can help me in the final few years of my career, um, we need improved mental health services in schools, in our community. We have a lack of providers. You heard that from my partners with DCFS. We lack mentoring services. We have a lot of people, we need more. We need to get in there and really figure out how to keep these kids from finishing their terms of probation and committing more crimes. How do we, how do, we do this? Um, our mental health services, uh, I mean, there's no good answer. There's wait list. There's not enough. I also would say that our kids coming out of our pandemic, the, the level of violence is, has increased. It's not a school fight like we used to see in my years. It's not just, you know, I punch you once and, and you know, that's it. You're down, I win. Now it's I punch you once, you're on the ground, I kick you in the head, I continue to stomp on you. Um, and if you like you assemblywoman, have to watch those body cams over and over and over again of children just beating children. It's really hard on your soul, and you really want to try to figure out how to get to the root of what's going on and, and fix that. But the, we need, as a community, uh, trying to help this 
this population of youth some services around us and and that's going to take some creativity working possibly with our university systems and college systems to get some incentives to get people to want to stay here and get people to want to work with our kids um, we need blended sentencing i i am um, not encouraged by what the fact that we when we do have to take children out of our community because of the offenses that they are committing and the risk that they place upon our community that we send them to lovelock i i get that's not ideal but if we can't commit to putting together a blended sentencing model that this this legislative body has been studying session after session to get together and say you know we can put them in a in a facility because there are children that need to be removed from from the community I hate to say it there are um, and but we need to be responsible about how we do that and where we put them so that they're they are getting appropriate levels of services for their brain and then if they have to stay past 21 then then they need to stay past 21 but we need that blended sentencing model so those are my my wish lists for the future and i'm gonna I, I guess pass it over i'll help my colleague in washoe county do hers and then um we'll take questions maybe together if that's what you'd like chairwoman yes i think that would be fantastic and and i apologize i did misspeak um uh, ms anderson you, you can <laughs> leave the table <laughs> she's been elevated to DA. i, I know <laughs> she's, she's, good. Good. she's right <laughs> She's like, passing the bar was a lot easier than I said. <laughs> um, but yes, please, thank you. OK, I might need IT to figure out how to. This. You want to yeah, do it? I'll get it. That's fine. Yeah. We'll juggle here. Okay. And then Chief Deputy DA Scott, please yes. proceed from Washoe County. Please proceed when you're ready. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Shelley Scott, Chief Deputy District Attorney, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak with you. I, as my colleague here, um, have been in this system for about 30 years, uh, 10 in California and 22, 24 coming up in um, Washoe County. So I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of good. Um, I know how much effort our team members put into keeping our children safe, to getting services to our children, and in those cases where it's necessary to remove them from the community that we do it in the most uh, behaviorally appropriate manner possible. Um, knowing that juvenile justice is a niche and not a whole lot of people understand where we came from and how we got to be here. I just put a couple of slides in to introduce you into the history of juvenile justice. Um, it was originally created because of the idea that juveniles and adults should be treated different. And the idea initially was fully incorporate rehabilitation as well as some punishment. In 1899, the first juvenile court was established in Illinois. Illinois has led the um, juvenile justice reform pretty much since the inception. And by 1925, almost all of the states in the United States had created a juvenile court. We operated initially in the 1960s of parents patriae, basically taking the place of the parent and wanting to put them under the umbrella of the courts instead of just um, punishing them as adult criminals are punished. In the 60s, In re Gold gave all of the constitutional protections to our youth, save and except for a jury trial. They have the same rights as an adult offender does, the right to counsel, the privilege against self-incrimination, um, cross-examination, confrontation, and all of the Fourth Amendment rights against um, unlawful searches and seizures all came into play with the juvenile justice system. And this really initiated the Juvenile Justice Reform Act. The JDAI is Juvenile Detention Alternative Initiative. This was something that came to our state in late 2003, early 2004, and Clark and Washoe both participated 
in this new approach to juvenile justice. The triangle represents the three aspects that we seek to utilize when we are working with a youth. Addressing community protection, and as a deputy district attorney, that is one of my chief functions. Holding youth accountable so they recognize the impropriety of their actions and community development and restorative justice rehabilitation. They were the three prongs to this balanced approach. And what it wanted us to do is to put services on the front end, service heavily load that front end of the access to the juvenile justice system to keep them from penetrating deeper into the system or even into the community um, criminal system. So we put these programs in place, front ended with our juvenile probation department, added resources to address them at intake, much like the harbor is now working in a more formal manner to try and keep youth from getting to my desk in the first place and moving them out of detention as soon as safe alternatives can be located. Um, the average stays after initiation of this juvenile detention alternatives um, with evening reported, supervised relief, release, we engaged our community partners with the Boys and Girls Club working hand in hand with juvenile probation. Um, outreach specialists, both with juvenile probation and mental health counselors, some wraparound services, electronic monitoring to make sure that the kids coming out of detention um, were monitored for a period of time or, or house arrest, moved these youth out of our facilities, and reduced our average daily population in four years by 50%. So when I first started at the district attorney's office in juvenile delinquency, uh, many of you may remember the old Wittenberg Hall. It's now the parking structure at Renown. Um, but when we had that facility, we had over 100 youth detained. And people, the youth were housed, I mean, even in the lunchroom on um, bunk beds because of the huge overcrowding. We were fortunate enough to build a new juvenile justice center that will house over 100 people. Its current average daily population is about 28. So we have taken the majority of kids that can be safely monitored in the community, wrap services around them, and release them back to their families or back into other services so that they're not in detention. This was huge. Um, my office is much smaller than Clark County. We serve a much smaller population. There are four of us attorneys in the Washoe County District Attorney's Office. That's myself and three um, supports. We have two legal secretaries and a half-time office assistant to try and get all of our cases into our new computing system. We do not have a dedicated advocate or an investigator. We're on the rotation um, if a need arises we request it and pending availability, we'll get the assistance. The only cases that we currently have that automatically get an, an advocate assigned out the door in my office are the sexual assault lewdness cases because we don't want, we want a seamless handoff from our CAC partners where most of the investigation has taken place, which is the Child Advocacy Center to the district attorney's office to make sure victims don't fall through the cracks. So the advocate is assigned initially for the handoff purposes there. You've seen this slide with uh, my partner. There are multiple avenues of diverting kids out of our system. We see very few misdemeanors now coming through in juvenile justice unless there have been multiple attempts to attempt to rehabilitate and a youth keeps offending. Probation will send the misdemeanor offenses to us if they've had lack of either follow through by the family or um, repeated offenders and the problems not getting addressed at a lower level of supervision and intervention. Ultimately, however, um, our referrals have gone down. This was a slide. Uh, prepared and presented to me by my juvenile justice, juvenile service partners, the probation department, showing their numbers since uh, 2017. 
2019 to 2022, the total number of referrals. So they've received about 3,300 referrals from local law enforcement in 2019, um, down to about 2,500 for 2022, excuse me, too many twos. Um, and it's interesting to see the pandemic really shut down the numbers received by juvenile justice because our kids weren't in school. The school police are a primary referral source because that's where you see eyes on every day. When the kids don't have the eyes on every day and um, we're not in the community, given all the shutdowns and the pandemic, we saw a significant number of reduction in referrals. Once those restrictions started picking, being eliminated and kids were coming back, a lot of the frustrations and anger and isolation that they dealt with during that pandemic started to show itself. And I think we've seen those numbers increase in the last couple of years, especially with crimes of violence as um, articulated by a ADA uh, Duffy. The county the cases that we handed, handled that we received from juvenile services obviously went down as well. The yellow indicates the number of charges. It's important to note that in the juvenile justice system, we treat kids, not crimes. So a lot of times more than one agency will have um, referrals or made arrests on a child. Those don't come in individually. Probation serves as the funnel point through which those come in and the referral will come to us on a single docket sheet that can include agency charges from multiple agencies. So that's why there's a big disparity between charges and referrals is because there are often multiple agencies that are included on a referral. As you can see though, we traditionally have um, reviewed and no issued or returned the cases that we do receive somewhere between 20 and 30% go will either be no issued or referred back to juvenile probation for informal handling without a petition being filed, even when it has come to us. Once it does come to us, there's a possibility of sending it back after a plea is admitted and those, it's just another opportunity to remove the child from the um, formal juvenile justice system and give them an opportunity to have charges dismissed when they complete the informal sanctions. Um, I have completed um, the top five charges. I don't have actual numbers for you and I apologize to the committee for this. Uh, we switched case management systems mid-year last year so it's really difficult to try and find the numbers and I think most of youth parole's numbers got lost altogether. So um, just in generalities, um, parole and probation are the highest uh, referral source as um, Ms. Duffy indicated that's a lot of times associated with a new delinquent offense. Um, so they come over together. Um, we have seen a drastic number of increases in substance use and substance abuse in our systems. Currently we are working with juvenile probation and the Washoe County School District to try and put some services and interventions in place before the kids go uh, become juvenile justice front end kids before they make that referral, before they make the arrest. Washoe County used to have a substance abuse program that was taught to its um, students where they had picked up a substance related offense. With the pandemic that went out of play and there were no interventions that the school was able to offer for our kids probably from 20 late 19 or 20 until 22. They are reinitiating that system now to provide services and interventions and counseling to the youth in the school district, which should alleviate the number of cases being routed to probation and ultimately to my office. What we are mostly seeing in the school district has modified from um, your weed, meaning the green leafy substance, to, to concentrated cannabis vapes. Um, they're easy to, easy to find, easy to access, easy to conceal. 
Join Together Northern Nevada has even talked with the school district about putting vape detectors into the restrooms at school. It's become such an issue. Uh, I don't know where that is going. I can see that making a huge escalation in the number of cases that are identified. I don't know if that means that it will trickle down into the juvenile justice system or if they will have the protections and services in place to address them at the school level. Aside from that area, we see similarly what has been seen in Clark County. That's the increase in violence against persons, either uh, physical violence, domestic partnerships, um, and weapons use. Weapons have gone through the roof, primarily firearms. We have seen more unserialized firearms in the last year than I've seen in the last 15 years. It is a big issue for our kids, and they're easy to come by. I, from breaking into cars, targeting parents who have guns, um, one young lady was upset with her stepdad who had a lot of firearms. She laid them all out on the, the bed, called her boyfriend, said, come get them. They break into the house, steal his six firearms, discharge one accidentally in the house, take them all back to school. Um, so it's a huge issue with our kids. Um, many of those have then been used to commit very heinous crimes against other youth in our community as well as other adults in our community. Briefly touched on by my um, DCFS partners were the differences between the criminal and the ju juvenile system, and one of them is um, dispositional outcomes. In criminal settings, there are certain determinate sentences for crimes. None of those exist in the juvenile justice system, and in fact, no crime has any, excuse me, delinquent act, I apologize if I slip, but none of them have any mandatory incarceration. Most of the services are designed to rehabilitate and the accountability piece is where we get community service, get the kids active in the community, working with um, nonprofits, working on the work program to feel a little pain for the delinquent act they've caused, but give them the support to continue to rehabilitate as they come through the system. And as um, Ms. Duffy indicated, we do have the ability to keep kids on our caseload through age 21 as probation or paroles, uh, probationers or parolees and have that supervision and services to them and their families until they um, are past the age of majority. One of the things that Washoe County has done is called a Project One system. That is a special designation for our youth that are cross-designated, meaning they're active in the abuse and neglect system um, as well as the juvenile justice system. It's one court, one family in that regard, so the judge that oversees the delinquent acts that the kids are engaged in has also seen the abuse and neglect that's gone on in the family. It makes a much more cohesive approach to this very special population, and I think we've had some pretty good results. Um, judge Rob, our district court judge, oversees that population and has handled the cases for the last several years. This is just another pie chart to show you how much, how many of our cases actually get diverted out of the system. Probation handles about 80% of their cases informally or through a diversion program that's come back from my office and they handle them with case managers and the intake specialists with juvenile probation. Only about 20% will be on active compliance supervision and then 1% of the cases that come in go to youth parole after being sent to DCFS. You've seen this, this funnel and it's just another representation of where along the process we can divert kids from the initial arrest and, and citation diverted out of the system with intake, diverted by probation's internal house, uh, diverted by informal probation where a kid will come to court but is referred back for informal supervision, either by 
um, agreement or by uh, court order, and then ultimately down through the levels of juvenile probation supervision involving both our China Spring Youth Camp, which is our regional program that you spoke, you heard from earlier, ultimately to our state correctional and those very few that are moved out of the system into adult certification. Um, AB 230, as indicated earlier, um, removed automatic certification or direct files for kids that were 16 years or older that had been previously adjudicated of a felony. Um, it eliminated um, those youth who had then reoffended with a firearm or had reoffended with sexual violence. Those were the two that were removed from the automatic or direct file situation. AB 230 also removed presumptive certification for those kids that were 16 years of older but did not have a prior felony conviction. The motion for certification still had to be filed, but the court was they, they were presumed unfit for juvenile court. Um, if they were 16 years of old, age or older and either committed a firearms offense or an offense of a sexual assault involving force or violence. Those were the crimes that were removed. Washoe County was not as impacted by the AB 230 as our colleagues in Clark. Um, our process for determining whether or not to file a motion for certification is um, more front end loaded. We don't end up filing as many. The process in Washoe County is staffing with the juvenile team, staffing with the ADA that oversees the criminal division and a criminal DA on the facts of the case, the history of the child that may or may not previously exist. It is only with the concurrence of all three of those um, that a motion will be filed. We also provide to our defense attorneys and youth any opportunity to present us mitigation information, uh, problems with the families, um, any psychological reports, anything that they think is important. ACEs, which is the, the adolescent child um, experiences that have neg negatively impacted the child that may affect them making them more appropriate to remain in the juvenile system. So we look at all of that information on the front end. It does mean more than likely our kids are spending some more time in detention than they would if we filed the motion and moved ahead. Um, but we do like the way that process has moved forward. There have been very few cases that we've actually filed. Um, as you can see, the uh, cases that are filed are almost always stipulated to by the youth because we vetted the case pretty thoroughly before we move forward. Um, we have only had a couple of impacts of AB 230 and that was one that was that remained in the juvenile system last year and one this year. And once we filed on the one this year, he was um, stipulated to go to the adult court. It was a, a crime spree of uh, robbery um, throughout the valley, several different locations, uses of firearms. Um, one person was shot in the chest. It was not a, a good place. One other thing that, this, that I have seen and have been impacted in Washoe County is with the protection order hearings that came about last legislative session in, in SB7. That was where the adverse party, the youth that was being, uh, to, to whom a protection order was being um, placed on, was automatically appointed counsel. And that counsel came from our public defender's office. Those were cases involving domestic relationships, sexual violence primarily. Um, through April of 2022, 36 cases had come to the hearing. Um, all counsel had been appointed for the, for the adverse party, but none for the petitioner. And we're not, act the DA's office is not actively involved in protection order hearings. How this came to my attention was in sexual assault cases 
where my victim and her family had sought an order of protection, had gone to court against the adverse party who was represented by the same counsel who's now representing him in the juvenile delinquent action. So they've already had one shot at my victim before I even get a case. And um, that victim has been there without representation because there was no notice. That's one of the things that I am hoping in my moving forward is that we'll be able to address the victims of the domestic violence and the sexual assault protection orders to allow for the petitioner, a juvenile petitioner, to also be represented by appointed counsel such as um, Washoe Legal Services or another entity. Um, it is not appropriate for the state to take on that role because we represent the state, not directly the victim. But it has been a big impediment to the comfort level of my victims when I now get them into the juvenile court because they've already been through at least one court hearing where they were questions by judge and, and opposing counsel and felt blindsided by the juvenile justice system, which is unfortunate. Um, the other two things uh, that I have moving forward are very similar to what you've heard this morning. We have a, a significant lack of mental health services in our communities, in our school systems, to work with the youth as they're coming into the system, and then ultimately a blended sentencing that the committees, um, Supreme Court Committee, Juvenile Justice, the Assembly, we've been talking about and trying to figure out a way to do this for many, many years. It does have a huge fiscal impact. Um, and unless we can figure another workaround, I unfortunately don't see that it's gonna be happening in the near future, but it would be a huge benefit for our kids. It would be a way to keep them in the juvenile justice system with appropriate interventions, uh, behavioral, um, psychological interventions, and not put them directly into the criminal justice system. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for allowing me this presentation, and Ms. Duffy and I welcome your uh, questions. Thank you for that. Um, our first question will come from, and I mean, th thank you for the presentation. Our first question will come from Assemblyman Orlicker. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentations. Uh, one thing that struck me was in the top, referred charges in Washoe, the second was controlled substances. I didn't see it at all in your top 10. Could you, uh, so why the differences? Bridget Duffy for the record, um, Assemblyman Ornlicker. I think the diff in Clark County, almost all of those offenses are deferred to our Harbor program. That's, and we were close, and then we have with our school justice partnership um, but, which is my office, along with school police and um, school administration and juvenile justice services, we have worked to, um, over the last several years, to ask the school administration to refer those children out to um, the Harbor program. We only see them if the families will not engage in that program. If they engage in the program, then I never see the case. Yeah, so have you tried to do something analogous in Washoe so they don't have to come into your system? Shelley Scott, uh, Chief Deputy District Attorney, Washoe County, thank you. Um, we have no means for diverting them at this point, which is why the school district is working with our juvenile justice system, our probation partners, and my office to reinitiate much of the school programming before referring it to juvenile justice in the first place because we don't have that outside entity such as the harbor that can um, accommodate the number of cases that we see. It clearly is something that we hope is able to be diverted from the juvenile justice system with appropriate treatment and interventions because these aren't our violent offenders. Um, but at this point, unfortunately, we don't. Thank you for the question, Assemblyman. 
Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here, Ms. Scott. It's uh, and Ms. Duffy, who I am a little disturbed. I think I heard retirement on the horizon, but uh, uh, thank you both for what you do. Back to the top 10 charges that we're looking at and some of these concerns. I'm curious as to what degree maybe, do we, under, do we have a number or a percentage of gang-related activity in relationship to perhaps robbery with a deadly weapon, um, some of the minors that might be in possession of a weapon? I'm just curious what degree gang activity is playing in this in the youthful offenders. Bridget Duffy, for the record, uh, thank you for the question, Assemblywoman Hanson. I um, I don't know, and I would only be guessing and telling you what I can project just about because I read all the arrest reports that come through for those felonies, but I don't have an indication of how many are gang related. If I may, Assemblyman Hansen, or Assemblywoman Hansen, Shelley Scott, for the record, um, I actually am the gang liaison for my office, so I attend the briefings. I have all the gang caseloads that actually end up on my desk for prosecution. And in addition to reviewing um, the overall type of cases that come in involving guns, I would say we're looking at at least 70% of our cases are, are gang related that have had guns um, or used guns in a violent manner. There are the occasional outliers, but primarily it is gang related youth that have been arming themselves with firearms. So I have a question on that. Um, and, and I guess the question goes back to a more general question about guns in the schools. Um, and, and so there are, and, and earlier, Ms. Duffy, you, you presented about gun-related offenses. So a commission of another crime using a gun, whether it's a robbery or um, an attack or whatever it is. But we also know there's oftentimes where students have guns in schools that they haven't used in a crime. It's just the crime is the possession of the gun in school. And, and so do we have data separating those two out? Because I know often when we ask the students the reasons why they have the guns, sometimes they can articulate very specific reasons, which could be for protection. Uh, the, the student threatened me they were going to fight me or they were going to come for my family or bullying or, or that they literally, and again, we appreciate a juvenile logical mind, that this is the best scenario for protection. So it's not always that we're actually using the firearm or intend to use it on, on others other than actual protection. We've also had students, because it's cool, it will give me status and I wanted to show it off. And so do we have a separation between those who are actually committing violent offenses with firearms and then those students who are bringing them for these miscellaneous reasons? Bridget Duffy, for the record. Uh, Chair Miller, um, I would think that school police would be able to tell you how many firearms were retrieved off of school campuses. I do not have that breakdown, but I'll give you a, a lead for that research. Um, the, uh, in, my, in my stats, I believe you'll see we have 331 in 2022 minor in possession of a firearm and 257 robbery with use of the firearm. So you can see some of those, some of those minor in possessions probably weren't in use of any type of, of additional offense. Um, so we could find out from school police how many there are. And I agree. Uh, that is uh, probably the number one thing we hear is I brought it for protection. It also scares me a lot because we go back to that, that child who has poor impulse control, <laughs> you know, not developed reasoning skills, and, um, and firearms in the hands of children are the scariest thing I can think of. Thank you for that. Uh, Assemblywoman Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, 
so we've we've heard a lot about trends with women who are incarcerated over the last few years. Are we seeing those same type of trends with the girls that are in the system right now? Um, are you keeping track? Can you tell us about about what you're seeing with girls versus the boys and, and why they're there? Bridget Duffy, for the record, Assemblywoman Cohen. Um, I don't, uh, Juvenile Justice Services would have the exact statistics, but I know we have an increase in our girls committing delinquent acts. Um, our girls' population in juvenile detention has um, been on the rise. A lot of those girls have severe mental health treatment needs, um, and, and we're unable to find solid mental health services for them, and so detention becomes our alternative because they are, um, you know, committing violent offenses in the community uh, among other children and, and among adults. So we do have a, an issue with our girls' population. Um, we definitely need uh, more mentors for girls, uh, more strong mentors to come forward for them. I think that would be one big uh, help, mental health services to deal with some, some trauma that our, our children that are female in, in Clark County have suffered, um, sexual trauma, uh, being one of the big, um, you know, predecessors of our, of them starting to commit acts of violence in the community. So uh, juvenile justice services, I can, I can get to that with them and let you know over the last maybe five year trends of where we see our girls population increasing. Uh, in Clark County, we did just open, um, the Department of Juvenile Justice Services did just open a facility to assist with girls kind of so that we don't have to go from zero to Caliente or Nevada Youth Training Center. Uh, we did open a, a facility, it's a, it's a staff house in, in Clark County, staffed by juvenile probation, and I believe Rites of Passage is the private provider. So they are a struggle for us. Shelly Scott, for the record, we have seen the same trends in our detention facility, at least currently um, with the population that's averaging about 30, we've seen girls as high as 12. So they have become a high population in the detention facility. They don't normally stay as long in the facility and they cycle through, meaning at times um, we'll have one or two, then we'll hit a, a peak um, some of that has to do with the girls um, acting together in placements and because they've either um, eloped from placements, stolen cars and run away from a placement together or they've planned a breakout of mental health facility together, we see them come in in bunches. So the numbers will increase based upon them committing acts together. Um, we have our Aurora Pine, which is the girls' facility at China Spring. So that is our group regional placement for them besides juvenile justice. We access um, Sage, Sierra Sage, which deals a lot of our mental health providers, our sexually trafficked and or um, at-risk youth. The girls go through that program, which is a is supervised and um, run by rites of passage up in the north. So we have some of those facilities, but not nearly enough to meet our, the needs of our youth as they're coming in. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go next to Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for being here. Um, I just had a question. Um, Ms. Steffi, you had sort of indicated that most of w the weapons that w we were seeing for juveniles um, were found in homes. That's also what I've learned in my research, um, is that usually unsecure firearms. But then um, you, you indicated in Washoe that 70% were gangs. So is it just a difference in Southern Nevada and Northern Nevada? Because those numbers don't seem to add up unless I'm missing something. Bridget Duffy, for the record. Um, Assemblywoman Axel, uh, Bill Axelrod, I don't have the stats for gangs, so I don't know. They might add up. 
to 70 percent i just i really don't know um most of what <laughs> if i could do a public service announcement please don't leave your firearms in your cars mm. uh, a, a lot of what and what i heard um chief da scott say is what we see too is children are doing these little like handle jiggle things when and people are leaving their guns in their cars unlocked on streets in driveways and parking lots and and so we have people reporting that their car has been broken into and their gun is missing. And then we find the gun in the hands of a child. So that's, that's one way we see them. Another way we see them is, is through um, homes, residences. Um, you know, recently had a, a, a elementary school, well, maybe sixth grade, so that's middle school, brought a gun and sold it to another kid at school that he got from his uncle's house because his uncle just had guns and drawers in the living room. So, um, and he just decided to come and bring a gun to school to sell it. And at the age of like 11. So yes, we see some of that. We also get kids, um, I think more of our, our more sophisticated kids that are gang related, they find a lot of guns in parks. Apparently there are guns bushes in our parks. Um, that's the other thing we hear. Where'd you get the firearm um, in, in a bush at a park? Um, so we see that um, lots of obliterated serial numbers, so they're untraceable. Uh, lots of sophistication there, uh, but that's it's it's from a lot of different ways that we see them. I don't know that I could pinpoint the main way. These are just the ones that we see. Thank you for that question. Next, we have Assemblyman um, Gray, and he has a question for both Clark and Washoe as well. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Deputy DA Scott, thanks for being here today. You had mentioned unserialized guns and then about how easy they were to obtain, you know, breaking into cars and then the, the one uh, child, you know, at home, putting them all in the bed. Are you talking about actually 80% uh, guns that are finished by uh, somebody that's bought the kit to finish building it? Or are you talking about firearms in general that have had their, you know, had their serial number obliterated? Thank you for the question, Shelley Scott, for the record. Um, Assemblyman Gray, the ghost guns that I'm talking about are ones that are um, polymer manufactured without serial numbers. We have seen probably five of those in the last year come across with our youth, which may not seem like a lot, but um, they're absolutely untraceable. They get handed um, off quicker than we can get search warrants to track them down. Clark, or Carson City has just had a huge incident involving the firearms. They get broken down and transferred and disappear. They, tracking them is the hard part. We have seen um, not as many guns that have obliterated serial numbers where someone has actually scratched them off. We're not seeing that as much. I am seeing guns with serial numbers and ghost guns. Madam Chair, follow on, please. please. Um, I, I guess the big question is what makes that any different than any other gun? I mean, especially if it's been obliterated. I mean, a gun without a serial number is just hard to trace, period. Um, so I guess how many are you, so you say five in the past year, but how many other guns, you know, were there 10 other guns or were there 100 other guns? Uh, For the record, uh, Shelley Scott, I can't tell you the number of guns that we've seen. Most of them are serialized. Um, I'm just concerned that the ones that I've seen that are um, polymer, unserialized ghost guns have been ending up in the hands of kids at school. I, I mean, I, thank, yeah. thank you thank for you. that. I, thank you. Like. And again, let's remember we're not, at the end of the day, the distinction is not between which type of gun we don't want any guns in our schools. Um, next question is from Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Thank you, Chairwoman, uh, and thank you um, for your presentation. Um, when we talk about uh, women in uh, now being an increase in uh, your your facilities or coming before you. Um, are you keeping any statistics? Um, and, and I'm asking this for, from your perspective and not from the juvenile, but 
the ones that you are, are you know, binding over. Um, age, race, um, any of that data so that we can sort of peel it back a little bit to see where this is coming from um, because there is some concern uh, in our urban communities that there is um, maybe a little bit of disproportionate, um, well, significant disproportionate um, arrest and adjudication of those young women. I'd like to know about that. Bridget Duffy, for the record, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Um, I do not have statistics because I do not have a case management system. Everything that I, I bring around certifications and direct files is a hand count um, that I have somebody on staff that does. Uh, so I get all of my stats from Juvenile Justice Services, and I'm, I feel very confident that they would have that information for you. That would be the Clark County Department of Juvenile Justice Services and probably Washoe County as well. They keep that kind of stats all the way down to uh, gender, race, ethnic. Shelley Scott, for the record, thank you, Assemblyman Summers Armstrong. I would echo the comments of my colleague, juvenile probation and juvenile services uh, keeps those numbers and keeps a very detailed account of uh, the youth, um, race, ethnic origin, ages, um, and crimes and are able to correlate that very well. We just established a case management system this past summer which can capture that information because our prior system did not. So it's something we'll be able to provide to you moving forward. Thank you. Proceed. Um, just finally, do you, do you all believe um, from what you're seeing um, with uh, those who are reoffending after COVID um, that there is a um, correlation between um, the effects of the lockdown and reoffense um, of the young folks who are, are coming through? For the record, Shelley Scott, thank you, Assemblyman Summers Armstrong. I don't have any statistical data on that, only from what we've seen in a, a case day-to-day -day system working in the system. I think the negative effects, mental health effects and isolation that our youth went through, especially the youth that were middle school aged and moved from middle school to high school during this um, pandemic have had a tremendous detriment. They didn't get the socialization. They didn't get that outlet that they were used to having and no place to funnel energy. So when they came back to the school, I know our school saw an increase, schools in Washoe County saw an increase in violence in the schools. And I, I can only, I can't correlate that officially, but it was an anomaly that we hadn't seen before. Bridget Duffy, for the record, I, I'd like to add, when we do our risk assessment, um, which we call the YLS, or the Youth Level of Services Assessment, to determine um, the appropriate level of probation or whether correctional care is needed or placement outside of the home is needed for our children, there are several indicators that we look at. And two of the highest risk factors of a ch child entering the juvenile justice system is lack of connection to education and lack of extracurricular activities. And when we went into that pandemic shutdown, we took away those two things from our kids out of necessity, but we have to expect that there's gonna be consequences for that. Because if you're saying that an, when we determine a high risk, risk child that needs to be removed from the community, and those are two of the things that are usually in those indicators, that's, that's the best I can get as a, not being a scientist, but, but knowing that those things are definitely gonna impact our kids' mental health. Thank you. Next question from Assemblywoman Hardy. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in looking at the, you've both shared information, you know, and statistics about the, the top five or 10 um, charges that were filed in 2022. And in looking at those, especially in Clark County, a lot of those were um, doubled or nearly doubled um, in their occurrences. So 
and, and admittedly, sadly, our youth have faced just unspeakable things in the last few years that many of us never faced or probably never will face, even our adult lives. You know, just what's going on in society and, and violence that they see themselves and, you know, emotional maturity and family, all of those things. Um, so my question is, when you, you know, the, these offenders, these youth come in, what is, um, like, what are the deterrents or what, what do you have, like, services possibly that help these kids so that they, they don't continue to commit these more violent offenses? Because that, that would be my concern. Like, we don't, we don't want them to continue to do this, so how do we help them? Are you, are you able to do that um, so that they don't? keep, you know, committing these more violent offenses. Bridget Duffy, for the record. Um, so uh, as I just mentioned, we have the YLS, which is our, our screening assessment tool to determine what type of, of um, supervision a child would need. It's really um, the offense has something to do with it, but it also looks at different factors around the child. So I would say in Clark County, a typical first time robbery without a firearm, just, um, or the, the child that's with the kid who had the firearm, but he didn't have the firearm. So maybe there's three kids. And so he's just along for the carjacking. A first time with no prior history in Clark County, that uh, juvenile would more likely than not be placed on probation with an electronic monitoring system and then um, whatever our risk assessment or our, I'm sorry, our youth assessment tool laid out, which would probably be counseling, community service, um, urinalysis testing, uh, mentoring if possible, um, any, and then any type of other type of gang interventions or, or services that we may have available. So that would be our typical first time offense, even for a felony in, in Clark County if you weren't holding the firearm. Now, if you're holding the firearm, then we would assess it to determine whether or not we'd be looking to certify you if you're 16 or 17. Um, so those are, that's, I mean, we have an array of services for kids. It's, it's really all about making sure that the uh, probation team is supervising them appropriately, that we have family engagement and what they need to do um, to prevent that, that, um, Reoffending, but you know sometimes with kids it's it's really hard because they'll just go back to you know the bad influences or the groups that they ran with or so I don't know it's it's difficult it's really just doing our best to make sure that we can give them what we have and and prevent them from going to the criminal justice system. Thank you for that. I don't see any additional uh, requests for questions right now. I do see requests for some data, though. So if we could, if you could submit to the committee uh, some statistics about the firearms that uh, have been seized, and also um, about, again, the gang-related youth crimes, especially because there seems to be such a um, difference with not, you know, reporting. And also, I guess we want a lot of data, as you said at the beginning, breakdown on female population increase by race and age. And if that specifically could um, reflect the increases for the female population and even if we could get that by offense and and I know it's difficult and when you when you brought when you first began your presentation you know in in all presentations right now in 2023 I feel like you know we have those kind of gap years those two years of the pandemic which really altered human behavior and pattern and trend. And, and so when you said, oh, I'm still including 2017, I appreciate that because it's almost like we have to start over because that was, for all of us adults, it was also a, a different time. So if you could submit that to the committee when possible. 
Bridget Duffy for the record. Uh, Chair Miller, if I could have one level of clarification. Mm -hmm. So I already wrote down the girl statistics, um, the gang related, and then on the firearm stats, mm -hmm. um, is that the the school school based firearms versus non school based school firearms? School based, okay. yes, please. Because I don't think I'm going to be able to give you a. I, I don't think even juvenile justice services clicks off what type of firearm it was. Correct. So, okay. Correct. School based versus. Community. But while the conversation was around schools and. Okay. That's where most of our youth are during the day. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. And with that, I will go ahead and close this agenda item for the presentation. I will open it up. Our last agenda item is for public comment. So those who, I'll, I'll give the phone number to give people an opportunity to call in while we're getting settled here in the room. The phone number is 1-669-900-6833. And the meeting ID is 865-784-47953. So as people are calling in, again, we ask that you keep your comments to two minutes. I will first start with anyone who would like to make public comment here in Carson City. Not seeing anyone approach, I would like to open up to anyone in Las Vegas. Broadcasting, is there anyone on the line that would like to make public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Anne Marie Graham for the record. My brother Thomas Purdy was murdered by Reno Police in Washoe County Sheriff's Office during a mental health crisis. Four people died on this date, February 14th, since the year 2000, D died during interactions with police in Nevada. 78 were black, 188 were white, 84 were Latino. Nine were Asian Pacific Islanders, seven Native American, and one Middle Eastern, and 54 unknown race. The four that died on today's date, 2-14-2014, DeAndre Berghardt, Jr. He was a pedestrian in the Red Rock Canyon National Conservation Area, got into an argument with two bicyclists upon arrival of NHP. A struggle ensued, and uh, he was shot by BLM and killed. 2-14-2009, Edmundo Del Valle Jr. was shot and killed by LVMPD while holding a BB gun. 2-14-04, Daniel Vincent Woskowski, a 33-year-old father of one son, Andrew, was shot and killed by LVMPD. 2404, Mateo Carlo Michella, a 30-year-old, was shot and killed while suicidal by LVMPD recently. Teachers and educators are out protesting and demanding more funding for education in schools in Nevada, as well as better pay. It's hard to do that when cities like Reno are using 50% of the general budget and the city of Sparks are using 71% of the general budget for public safety. I heard in government affairs testimony from Washer County Manager Eric Brown that there are no mental health services in Washer County for the youth. These youth turn into adults. I'd again like to mention my concerns regarding the safety and welfare of the incarcerated community members at Washer County Jail, where my brother was murdered and two other men were murdered by deputies. Roger Hilligus has communicated with many of us regarding the deplorable inhumane treatment of the incarcerated at Washoe County Jail. People with broken bones, arms, and legs are not being provided medical care. I will remind you all again, my brother was killed while in the care and custody of Washoe County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the line? Chair, the public line is up and now working. There are no other callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Then I will go ahead and close public comment. With that, uh, again, tomorrow we will have a mix of bills and presentations. I will see everyone promptly at 8 a.m. tomorrow on Wednesday the 15th. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.